Hello guys and you're welcome. In this lesson, we're going to have a quick hands-on approach to Python. First thing you need to do is to have a copy of Python. You could go over to python.org and uh, click on the download button for your specified version of your operating system. I'm on a Windows operating system, so I'm going to click on Python 3.10. And once that download is completed, I'll just go to where I have that download, click open file, and then I'll run the installer to inst and follow the uh, prompt to install Python. So that's great. And once Python is installed, I can quickly jump in and start using it. So I'll press the start button and I'll just type idle, which is the integrated development and learning environment. Note when you're installing Python and you select the path, you can open a command line. So I'll just do Windows and the R key and type in CMD. If the CMD comes up, I'll just type Python or we can check to see where Python is installed. So I'll just see where, and I'll just maximize this so we can actually see. So I'll say Python, and don't worry, you don't need to use the command prompt in this lesson. I'm just showing you that you can actually access that and use your command line to see Python. So it's telling me the location of Python and to activate Python, I'll just say Python, and you can actually see the same prompts we have right here when we have uh, when we run the Python shell. So let me just go ahead and close this. We'll be using the shell directly from idle. So now that the shell has opened up, what can we actually do in this environment? So this is a quick and very fast way to have access to Python functionality. And I encourage you to follow along as we type. First, I'm going to type a very special word. I'm going to say import this. And we can actually see the rules that are used to create Python. Some of them are funny, some of them are interesting, but these are the you know keywords that was used to create the language. So that's just by the way, I'm just showing you this. So you can actually have fun, fun typing import this, and you can see this information being displayed. We're going to discuss about what import statements mean later on within the course. So right now, what we're going to do is to just start typing something. So let's think about any numbers. I can think about 12. And if I press the return key, it's going to return 12, right? So what you, uh, what you import, what you type in is what you get typed out. That's great. If I type in one, I get one out. If I type in 22, I get 22 just like that, which is quite interesting. So what do I want to do? Why don't I add two numbers? Let's say 12 plus 12, and I get 24. If I multiply 12 by 12 to multiply, I use the asterisk symbol. I'll get 144. If you try to multiply by using the letter X by 12, you will actually get a syntax error. Now, this is an example of an error where you actually used the wrong type of value. So let's go ahead and uh, try something else. Let's say 12 minus five, and I get uh, seven. If I do 22 divided by 12, I have a float value. A floating point value is a value that has the decimal values either at the beginning or towards the end or in any of its parts. So decimally, definitely it's a decimal number. That's what floating point values are. There are other operators Python has. For instance, I can check if a number is greater than another number. I can say check if 3 is greater than 3. And this is false because 3 is equal to 3. If I want to check if a value is equal to another value, I can say 3 double equals at 3. And this is going to tell me that 3 is actually equal to 3, which is true. Let's try something else. Let's open up a bracket and place in two values. Let's say 12 plus 45. And let's check if that is greater than 100 divided by 3 like so. And we can actually see it's evaluating that value to true as well. So that means we can actually have true and false values by comparing two elements together. Basically, we just compare these two values to see if this value is greater than this value, which is great. Another thing we can do is to use the modulus operator, which returns a reminder based off a calculation. If I do 12 divided by 2, I'll get 6.0. But if I do 12 modulo 2, I just get the reminder, right? So after the fractional point. So basically, that's what it does. We can do 12 
two as well. I can actually see six. So we can use these two values to return the division. But notice this single stroke returns a float decimal value and this returns a positive whole number called an integer. Right, so that's the data types we have. But another thing we also want to do is to do the classic print hello world. So I'm just gonna say hello world like so. Close that and just print in the word hello world like so. All right, so what does this uh, print method mean? This is a what is called a function and what we pass into a function is called a parameter. Basically, we could do things like print, let's see, your name, and this is going to return your name. A function is a step-by-step -step procedure to carry out an action. And once you've created those actions once, you can save them and call that from those set of actions as a function. The print method has a set of actions all right, I can actually see an error here, but no problem. The print method has a set of built-in actions that have been pre-created for you. And there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of functions you can use to make writing code easier. So what happens when I exit idle? So I'm just going to close idle and let's press start again and say, bring in, uh, type in idle. And once that shows up, let's open up idle. Whatever we've done is lost. So the shell is a quick environment where you could just test out code. If you really want to save your code, then it's advisable to go to the file option right here. And let's do that. So let's go to file and create a new file. And once we see that new file opened up, you're not going to see all this information in the shell anymore. You'll just have an environment where you could write your code. Let's go to window. Sorry, options and click on show line numbers. Now this will actually show the line numbers. If I could press in return, I can see the line numbers. So now would be a really great time to save our code. So let's go ahead and say file and let's say save. And on our desktop, let's go ahead and create a new folder. So I'm gonna click on the new folder or you can right click and create new folder. And let's just see, get uh, first Python like so. And once I have that new folder, let's just call this our first code dot py. So this is going to save it as first code dot py, which is a Python file. If you save that file, you'll see the name of the file, including the path of the file. So this is where we can actually write our code and save it. If I type in the word print and I say hello, or you can even print our names. So let's type in our name as an argument. I'm typing in my name and I encourage you to please type in your own name. So if we save this and go to the run option and right here, see run module, the shell is going to open up and we can see the results on the shell. The cool thing now is if I go ahead and save this and I close this and close my shell and I go ahead and start idle and press the return key or click on it and go to file and go to recent file. I'm actually going to see my first code right here. I'm going to go to my options and bring out the line numbers and we can actually see this. So this is a very good way to save your Python files. You save your Python files in a Python document environment called a script. So this is a Python script and congratulations, you just created your first Python script. What we can also do is to actually look at the uh, environment we're working with. You can actually change how this looks. So this is our shell, right? This, sorry, this is our scripting environment. We can go to options and go to edit and change things. We can go to options and go to configure idle. We can even change the text type. If I click on this Dubai, or let's do Korea new. Or we can look for any serif or sans serif text. Basically, you can change this to any text you want. You can change it to Calibri and we can change the size of the text. So most likely your text is, might be smaller. So if I click apply, we can actually see we have a very small text right here. So I'll switch over and set this to 16 and click apply. So we can actually see we have a large um, text right here. 
All right, cool. So that's how you can customize that. You can even customize it and change the colors. If we go to the highlights and click on IDIC, we can select uh, idle dark and you can apply and you can see idle in a dark mode. I think I like this, so I'm going to be using idle in a dark mode. What you can also do is to actually go to the highlights and you can actually build your own custom theme. So each time you change a theme or change any value, let's say for instance, I change this value and this theme is going to ask me to set a new name for that theme. I'm just going to call it my awesome theme like so. And now that I have my awesome theme, I can begin to customize my theme. So right here, if I click on any of this uh, section, I'm going to go to the background. I can, I can choose a color for the background. So I'll just choose this solid dark text and I'll be seeing that text in the background. So basically, if I type in anything, we're actually going to be seeing our dark text in a background. We notice that it has a blue setting here. Let's go ahead and change that as well. So let's go to highlights and let's click on. So this is for the Python comments. So let's go ahead and change the color for the comments. The comments are going to be red. So I'm just changing them to this bright value for my Python comments. So uh, function name, var, the background. Basically, I'll just leave this here. So I'll just give you an idea how you can change this theme. If you want to set it back to the default theme, just click on the built in theme and you can select from these three uh, themes. I'll head over to my custom theme and select my awesome theme and click apply and I'll click OK. So right now we're in our awesome theme. So next, let's check out what syntax errors mean. So for instance, if I have a Python script right here and we can even look at the shell and type things in the shell if we have the shell open. So let's make a mistake right here and I'll close this and I'll get back here. Let's say I'm trying to use the print method and I forgot this close in parentheses. If I save this file and click on run and run this module, it says this was never closed, right? So if I go to options, I can run the Python shell and I can try the same thing. I can say print hi and I'll try to run this. So it says we get a syntax error because I created an error because it doesn't understand the syntax. So to fix this, I'm just going to do the proper thing and print the hi like so. So I'm going to get the results. So in our script environment, when we make a mistake, it tries to give us a hint and tell us why that thing is wrong. For instance, if I try running this and I save it, it's going to tell me it was never closed. The opening parentheses here was never closed. So if I close this like so, and I go to run and run, we actually see my name pop up right here. A quick way to run is actually to press F5. So if I quickly press F5, oops, I will actually see my results right here. So for some systems, you need to use the function key to actually run that as well. So that's what an example of a uh, runtime error is, a syntax error is. Another example of an error is when we actually try to print out this, our names directly as a text, and we just try to run that. So it says the name is not defined. I can define this by creating this and setting it up as a data type Python understands. So it understands what a string is. If we want to comment or you know tell other people what's happening in our program, we use what are called comments. Python has a few styles for comments. It uses the hash key to comments. So this is a comment. And this is not a comment. All right, so this is not a comment. If I save the script and we run this script using function and F5, we'll get an error. But if I convert this to a comment and I save the script and I go to run it, so I'll just go run this module, we can see it's fine. So basically the Python environment ignores any text you have that is, you know, has the pound sign in front of it. So that's a single line comment. If we want to create multiple line comments, we can use triple quotes like so, and then type in our text in between. So here I'm going to say this is a multi-line comment. 
and I can type as much as I want here. So this is also going to be ignored by the Python you know, compiler because, hey, you can actually see it's only the uh, our, our names that has been printed here. I'll just change this to uh, your awesome name. And I'll just save that. If you run it, we're actually going to see your awesome name on the screen. So this is actually super nice and this is uh, correct. So we're going to get a syntax error if we don't close our parentheses like so. So this value right here, this, this brings us to um, what variables are. If we want to store a value right in our program and retrieve that value, we can create a variable. A variable is basically a memory space in our program that stores a data type. So data types like we saw in our you know startup example when we're test running idle, uh, you know the kinds of data Python can understand. It can understand integers. So if I have a, a let's say a number, a number, and we set that to twenty three, and here I say float underscore number, and I set that to twenty three point four five. Python is going to understand this first one is an integer and this second guy right here is a floating point value. Python has a very good function called type that you can use to check the type of value that is stored as a variable. So here I'll just put a comment and just say creating variables like so. So to see these results, we need to, if we were in the shell, let's go ahead and open our shell. And I'm going to run Python shell and I'll quickly type uh, number equals 23. I'm going to see that result right on the shell. And okay, sorry about that, guys. This is not, seems to be uh, not working. I'll just go ahead and save this. So let's, uh, let's do idle. And let's just say number equals 23. Now, the reason why we're not seeing this is because of the setting I used. So I'll just go ahead and change that back to the uh, default settings. Go to highlights, and I'll use a built-in theme, and I use Idle Classic just for that. So we can actually work with this uh, default value, so we don't have anything that's overriding our uh, text uh, output. Basically, I can check the data type. So let's just say uh, check type of data. So if I say print and I say type and I pass in the number, so basically print the type of number we are working with. So I'll just go to F5 and it tells me this is in an integer which is part of the class object. Don't worry, we're going to look at the class object. So uh, don't be scared when you see what class is, but it's telling us this is an integer and we, if we do the same Let's just copy this and drop this down here at the bottom. And we see print type and I say float underscore number and I save that and run it. We're getting this type that this type is a float. Let's go ahead and create a string. So here, let's just say your underscore name. And then you need to put strings within a code so that Python will understand you're not typing in text, but you're typing in a text data type called a string. So let's just say uh, awesome name, like so. And we're going to print the type of your name. And don't forget to close the closing parentheses. And if we run this, we can actually see it tells us it's a class str. So these are primitive data types. They are traditional data types that have been created when Python has been created. When you're creating variables, there are some rules you need to uh, think about when you're uh, creating variable names. And you can assign values to variables using the equal sign as we've seen right here. So if I have a variable, and I want to assign a value to the variable. I use the equal sign and tie it, assign a uh, type in the data at the right hand side. So this is an integer that has been assigned to a variable called number. 
This is a float that has been assigned to a variable called float number. When you're creating variables, there are some rules you have to think about. You can start a variable with a uh, number. For instance, I can do 90 or triple zero, uh, let's say name equals, equals high, like so. If we save this and run it, it tells us this is an invalid decimal literal in the first place and you can't even start. Let's go ahead and save that. So if I save this and run it, this is fine. But once I have a zero or a number and save this and try to run it, run into that error because you can't start a variable name with a number. You can start a variable name with an underscore but that's a special case, so it's not really advisable to do that. If you know what you're doing, you can actually do that, but you can start a variable name with an underscore as well. You can use a uh, very nice descriptive name for your variables. Basically, let's say I'm trying to find out 60, uh, let's say seconds. It's gonna be uh, 60. So this actually makes sense. But if I do something like X dr, equals 60. Uh, this might be a bit confusing in the future when I'm uh, kind of like working with this, right? So let's bring in that error five and let's say uh, hi and let's just say uh, you can't create variables can't start with numbers. So let's just say uh, can't be with numerical values and look at my spelling special characters so another thing i can't do is i can't start the variable with you know say like a, a dollar sign and i'll just say name equals you know uh, man if we save that and try to run it, we'll get an error as well because we can't start a variable with a uh, special character as well. Now, another thing you should realize with variables is variables are case sensitive. So we'll just see uh, they are case sensitive, which that means if I have seconds right here and I say seconds equals 60 and I say uh, seconds, equals 60. You can actually see what I'm getting here. So I have three values I've created as seconds, but I'm actually, um, these three are all different stored in memory. They're all different because we've actually used a different identifier for each one. So because you type in seconds all lowercase and you have seconds with one uppercase or any combination of that character, it's not going to record as the same name. So basically that's what uh, we can actually use to uh, do that. So when we create comments, we can actually leave information that we can use to kind of like remember what we're doing, right? So we can even store values in a string and then print that result. So say for instance, we have our name and let's just type, let me just type in my full name like so. Because I have that name, now if I run the print method, I can type in name. So because I've declared a variable, if I run this, I actually see, um, I'm gonna see my name right here because you know I've actually uh, used a convention to store my name. So that's actually a very nice way to uh, kind of like work with variables. So next, let's go ahead and quickly look at strings and the string methods. Basically, we're going to see how we can work with strings and how we can get a uh, input from the user. So I'm just going to go here, go to create a new file. I'm going to go to file, save, and I'm going to call that strings underscore methods dot py because this is a Python file. All right, so we've actually uh, saved that and let's go to options and show our line numbers. And let's write a comment 
to quickly describe what we're doing. So you're walking with strings and string methods. So basically every class you see in Python, every data type like we've seen right here in this example, they have a set of functions that actually work with them. So like we actually uh, said the other time, let's say, uh, let's just go back to our empty string code right here. And let's do something like create a uh, name, A, and I'm gonna say uh, Peter, and let's say name two equals Paul. So what we can do is what is called string concatenations where we can join true strings together using the plus operator. If we actually use the plus operator on a string, it will join them together and add them together. So let's just do some, let's say full name, create another variable called full name. Let's say name one plus name two. So let's go ahead and print full name like so. If we save this and go to function and click F5, you actually see Peter Paul. So if we want to have a space in between, we can actually create an empty, uh, we can concatenate an empty object like so. So now we actually have that space in between. So we're going to do plus name two. I'm going to shift this like so. So let's save that and run it. So we have Peter, Paul, because we have that space in between. We can make the space a bit larger if we increase the space. And we'll say function and run this. We actually see that Peter, Paul is super far away. But we'll just bring this back and set it to one space. So you can actually see how we can have fun and create this uh, value right here. So that's one cool way to uh, work with the syntax. If we want to get the length of characters that are in a string, we can actually use the len method. So let's just see uh, length of in a string. Now uh, this, uh, this is gonna be an example of a string method. So we can see len of full name, like so, just to get the length of full name. Now, if we save this and control F5 to run this, we're just gonna get food Peter Paul, but we're not printing this value here called a uh, full name. So what we can actually say is print the length of full name. And if we run that, we can actually see 10. It means this, full name has 10 characters, right? So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, including the white space that makes this 10. So that's what we can actually do with uh, the uh, comment. We can even have a store a multi-line string. So let's see how we can store multi-line strings. So let's just say uh, content is going to be equal to you know some string and let's just type in today is a busy day i had to go to the store well to buy some oranges so to jump into the next line now i'm just going to use a single slash to indicate that I'm on the next line. And right here, I'm gonna say, and I met a friend I had not seen in a long time. So we actually just uh, stop this here. So I actually jumped and stepped into the next line using this. If I hadn't done this, it's actually going to see this as you know, like I just jumped the line and I haven't completed or closed this, which I'm going to get an error. But if I use the uh, slash right here, I can actually break this into this line. 
So what we can actually do is to say, uh, let's try print Just print the content of that line. I'm going to do a function and F5, and we actually see that we've, have, you know, kind of like break this uh, thing right here. The result is actually showing as a straight line here because it has more space and it's not breaking that output right here. So that's why it's doing that. But right here in our script, we can actually break a line into multiple lines. I can even break this from here, but then I don't, don't forget to use the single backslash. So that's how you can break your code in case it's actually going so long and going off the screen. Just use a single backslash and you can actually play and kind of like break that in a uh, line like so. So a uh, second way is actually to use, you know, the uh, triple code, but we can actually see that uh, working right there. So we can actually do what is called indexing, where we can actually get the content that is stored in a string. So let's say, for instance, I have a uh, name one, right? We have name one. If I say name one and I use square brackets to get the first element that is stored in name one. So let's go ahead and print this like so. So if I save this and go to run and run module, I should actually see P, which is the first letter of name one. So if I do name three, it's going to be zero. It's zero indexed. So it starts from zero, one, two, three. This should actually give us an E, which you actually see we have E right here because it's actually zero indexed. So that's one uh, cool thing about uh, negative indexing. We can also slice a string by using a uh, position. So let's see, let's say for instance, let's have something uh, longer. Let's go ahead and use, a, let's say a slicing. And what we're going to do is to print the few elements from the word content, like so. So I'm just going to say content. And I'll use the square brackets. And let's say the first, you know, five, like so, just to slice that. So if we press our function key and run, we should actually see today because I'm actually getting the first four elements. It actually excludes the last one. So this is zero, one, two, three, four, and excludes the last one. If I, let's see what happens when we do a uh, six and let's see function F5. We still get today because the sixth element here is a white space, right? So it actually counts the white space at all uh, as well. So if we want to actually get the, uh, so here we're going to see, uh, uh, let's just see uh, slicing. So here we're going to see first five elements. So if we want to get the uh, last elements, we can actually slice from a, a negative index. So what do I mean? So let's see. Uh, Let's say negative slicing. If I use a minus, see if I say for instance print content and I say uh, minus one, I'm starting from the last element, which is this. So if I say print the last index in content, I'm going to get an E right here. If I don't want to see all these prints, I'm just going to simply going to comment them out, comment this one out, comment this one out and comment our full name out so that we can just have the results from our slicing. So that's today and the last element is E. If I do a uh, negative minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, let's see what we get. So we actually have today. If I do a minus six and save that and press F5 to run, we can actually see we have uh, today and that value right there. So I'll just set this to minus five. We can also slice between two values, right? So let's see uh, slicing two values. So let's go ahead and say print, oops, content. And I'll start from the third element 
down to the uh, tenth element. I'll just close that, save it, and let's run that. So we can actually see a y dash is dash a. So that's <laughs> that's the content. I'm actually uh, uh, actually slicing from that string. So we actually started from the third, so zero, one, two, three. So we actually have a y, and then down to the eleventh one. So that's just what uh, what happened there. So it's actually fun to see you know all these uh, examples. Let's see what happens when we uh, just do this. Let's try for fun. Let's just do print content, and we just print only the separator like this. So let's go ahead and function and just run that. So we're actually getting the whole thing because we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't include any uh, indexes. So Python won't raise any, uh, you know, raise an index error. All right, so let's actually um, move on. We can even do negative indexing between two negative values. That might sound crazy, but that's very possible. So let's say, for instance, we can do print content. So we can start with, say, from minus 8 down to, let's say, minus 4. Now we can just close that. And let's just run this. So we have ONG. So it's starting from the negative value from the you know from the left down to minus four. Right. So uh, strings are actually uh, immutable. Basically, what that means is that uh, once you've created a string, you can actually uh, change it because you get an error if you want to change it. For instance, we have a string called name one Peter because I can have access to the index I can't really try and trick change it say for instance let's use the name or let's just create a new variable here so let's say uh, king underscore name equals MC hammer right so let's say I actually have trying to change the uh, second letter so let's just say, uh, let's say new king underscore name is equal to king underscore name. And I want to change the second element like so. Or oh, let's do some, let's just say, uh, let's make this sim simple. King underscore name. Let's say the second element is equal to, let's say, R. Like so. Let's save that and let's run it. So it doesn't support item assignment. So basically, I can't trick it. I can create a string and then change that value because this is actually. Uh, immutable right but what I can actually do is to manipulate a string using uh, strings methods so once again I've been telling you that each time we actually have a class it comes with uh, its methods bundled how do I know those methods how can I access those methods you can also always have uh, built-in help so I can actually say help on str And if I save that and run it, well, I'm not going to see anything because I actually have an error right here. So I'll just go ahead and comment that out. So if I actually run it, it actually squeezed some values right here. So if I open that, I can actually see the help that contains all the methods with a simple explanation of what I can do with those methods. And we're going to actually be uh, working with those methods right now. So what we're actually going to do is just to uh, begin. So some of the fun things to do is to actually change uh, something from an uppercase to a lowercase. So for instance, if I, uh, let's create a new variable. Let's say, uh, 
Superman. We'll just see Superman is going to be equal to uh, Clark Kent. And somebody comes up and tells me, hey, you know what, Superman, throw some respect on his name. So I'm like, okay, all right, so I'm going to say print Superman dot upper, like so. And if I save that and run it, I'm going to see the name Clark Kent showing in uppercase. And I'll just comment out this guy so it doesn't you know, show up when we're running or test running our code. So we've actually changed it from you know Superman to an upper Superman. And like I showed you, we can actually get the length of the name. So if I say print len Superman and run this, it actually tells us, tells us there are 10 characters there, including the white space for uh, Superman, which is actually uh, nice. So if we want to get rid of some of these white spaces that are within a string, we can actually do that. For instance, in our content right here, we have a lot of white spaces. How can we get rid of these white spaces and you know, remove them from the side of the string? So we can actually use the R strip to actually uh, strip that information from the string, right? So it, let's see. Um, so from the right side of our string, we can actually use the dot R strip method to actually uh, do that. So let's go ahead and see that. Uh, so let's say, uh, let's create a comment and say stripping white spaces. So I already have a uh, variable called content. So let's go ahead and strip the content from that. So let's just say content dot r strip like so. And to see our results, let's just go ahead and print the content of this. So let's save it and let's run it. So basically we actually see that we're stripping from the right side of that string. Uh, let's see, is that even working? Hmm. So the reason why that's not working is because we don't have any trailing white spaces in our uh, you know results. So let's go, let me just add this right here, add some space here, and add some space here as well. So we have trailing white spaces. So I'm just going to save that and let's run it. So you can see the first one, we actually have seen that trailing uh, white space, but from here, we actually are trying to like, get rid of it. So, and the reason why we're not getting this is because we need to save this as another variable because remember strings are not immutable. It means we can't change the content of the string once we create it. So we have to save it as another variable. So let's say content underscore two is gonna be equal to, which is the false content dot r, oh, r strip like so. And then here we're just simply going to print out our content underscore two. So if you do a function and run this guy, we should actually see that right here. All right, cool. So we can also use a start with or an ends with to see if a uh, string ends with a particular uh, character or you know a name or something let's say for instance our the king name here mc hammer let's see if it ends with uh, er or starts with a particular value so here let's just say uh, print and within our print method what we're going to say uh, is uh, king underscore name dot and then we'll pack all the ends with method so let's see uh, ends with 
And let's just try and see how that uh, is true. So if it ends with ER, and let's close that print statement, let's save this and run it. And we actually see we're getting a Boolean value, which tells us that yes, indeed, that character actually ends with uh, that specific value. So it ends with ER. We can always, che always check if it starts with a value as well. So let's do a starts with, you know, let's do that. And let's check if it starts with, uh, let's try two letters that it doesn't start with and just run it. And we can actually get a, we'll see a false value here. It means there is a, the king here, the name Superman, the king name, sorry, the MC Hammer. It also starts with this, but let's see if it starts with uh, MC and see if it's going to, you know, consider that this is a cap and this is a lower case. So let's save that and let's run it. So it's actually telling us, hmm, it doesn't start with that. But if we do this and save it and run it, we can actually see that that value is true. So like I said, it's very case sensitive. It's not seeing the little M and the uh, capital M as these two uh, values. So that's one thing to uh, quickly kind of like look at. So another thing we're going to do next is to actually look at user input because our program is going to be boring if we don't have a way to let the user type in an input. So here I'm just going to go to file and create a new file. Let's go to file and save our file. Let's call that the user input.py. Let's go to options and let's show our line numbers and let's maximize this as well. So in this lesson, we're going to work with user, oops, input like so. So I'll just go ahead and save that. So to get an input from the user, we use the input method. So basically the input method. And like I said, a method is a set of predefined, you know, uh, instructions that have been saved. And each time you call a method, you're calling a shorthand of all those instructions. Those instructions might be created by you or someone else. For instance, we didn't create the input method. The input method was given to us for free by Python, and we're going to use it in this example. So what we're going to do now is to actually uh, prompt uh, an output to the user. So let's say, for instance, I'm going to say print, please enter your name. So if I save that and run it, we're going to see please enter your name on the screen like so. But uh, a cool way to do this is to use that directly within the input uh, statement. So I'll just uh, comment this out and I'll say, I'll just say user input, which is a variable to store this value. So I'm just going to say input and type in that text. Please enter your name. But because we know how variables work, what we're going to do is to create a string to store this information. So let's cut that and create a variable. So let's just say greetings and store that variable in greetings. Remember, let's use the code so we don't forget, like so. And then here, I'm just going to pass in Greetings. Once we save that and run it, we should actually see a prompt telling us to enter a name. And I'll just say hi, and I'll run that, and nothing happens. We created a variable to store our input, and we're not doing anything with that input. So what I'm going to do next is to print our input. So I'm just going to say print user input. And when we save that and run it, we should actually see your username. So let's say my name is Mahmood. Oh, I just finished my name right there. So here we can actually get a user input and we can actually you know, change that user input as well. 
what we can actually do is to add comments into our user input. To do that, let's go ahead and see how we can do it. So here, where we're actually printing our output, we can add a string here. So let's just see a user name is and then we can use a comma to kind of like uh, separate those two values. It is what is called function overloading where our method can exist in different forms. Basically our method can now accept two different parameters. So that's what we just did right there. And if you run this, it says please enter your name. If I say it, uh, if I say my name is house, it's gonna say username is house because we're actually adding that information in the print uh, method right there. So that's one uh, quick way we can actually do this. What we can also do is to actually change things. For instance, if we pass in our greetings here, our user input, what we can do is to change our user input to another uh, case, right? Such that when the result is being displayed on the screen, we can actually see, you know, something else. I can actually say user underscore input equals our user underscore input dot to upper, like so. So basically what I just did here was to change the input from the user to upper case. So if I save that and let's run this and I say mode this time around I'm gonna call myself house. Whoops, it says so did you try to change this to its upper? So it's going ahead. I think it doesn't have uh it's just upper. Sorry guys. So I'll just save that and run it. So let's just quickly uh, type in my name, or you can type in your name and boom, voila. You just created a simple computer program that takes in the user input and changes that input to a capital letter. You can put that on your portfolio. All right, so that's, uh, that's one thing. So like we saw in our example, if we um, use numbers and strings, it, uh, it act we can actually get funny uh, results. So for instance, let's say, uh, Let's let's say uh, let's say name equals and you can type any name. Let's just say dog. So now that we have this dog, if we do print three times the name, let's see what happens. Because we're actually applying math operators right here. Whoa, let's get rid of this. Let's comment this out. If you want to comment multiple uh, texts just use a multi-line comment and that'll be fine. So I just put this in between these three quotes like so. So this can actually, uh, this is a comment. So we can actually comment that out using the multi-line comment or doc string. Doc string. So we actually see we have dog, dog, dog because we actually printed out dog three times. So if you use a math operator or a numerical operator on a string, it will actually result in doing you know multiple things with that string as well so basically that's uh how that works another thing sometimes you find yourself doing is that you would want to convert from one format to the other to make things compatible for instance i cannot add a number to a string let's try it let's say uh bottles equals four and name equals Hassan. I cannot say uh, sum equals name plus bottles. So let's just see sum, sum of these two values equals name plus bottle and I'm just going to say I'm going to print some underscore values like so. So if I try doing that, um, it tells me I cannot do that because I'm trying to combine 
you know, a number and a string. So what I can do is to actually change one of these values to a number, for instance. Now, Hassan might not be your best example. So I'm just going to see a number of number of bottles. I'll just say eight right here. But this eight, I'm going to make sure this eight is a string. So next, I'm going to change this and I'm going to use the number underscore of underscore bottles. Now, using an underscore is a valid way of you know, kind of like creating variables because it makes it easily and uh, it makes it readable. So here, if I run this as well, I'll be expected to have that same error. But next, what I can do right here is to change this number of bottles into an integer. And to do that, I'm just going to say int like so, number of bottles. So it's in the same format as this. Remember, if we say, uh, if we print the type of bottles right before this if we run this whoops it says it was never closed so I just need to close this and save it and run it so it says bottle is not defined did you mean bottles so it's actually giving me a hint as to where I have my uh, error so it's bottles so I need to fix that whoops so number of Bottle. Okay, I'm, I think I have an issue with, you know, getting rid of S's. So we can actually see that is an integer type. And then the value we're getting right here is an integer type as well. And it's, it can now add these two together because this type is, you know, uh, kind of like working with this type. So that's how we convert, you know, a string value to a number. We can do the same thing with numbers as well. We can convert a number to a string. So for instance, our bottles as a number. So we can do print and just we can do str bottles. So we can we can actually uh we're converting a string to a number over here and once we've done that let's go ahead and print the uh, the type of bottles now don't forget the double closing double parentheses to close that and we can actually see we've changed it to an uh, end okay cool so again, uh, sorry guys, because it's immutable, what I need to do is to save this as another value because we've already created that. So we can't actually uh, change it. So that's why we're getting that uh, results over there. So what we can actually do is to uh, prevent, that's important because you want to prevent a user from entering a uh, wrong value, entering a uh, the appropriate value, not the uh, wrong values. For instance, if we are actually getting the user input, let's say uh, a number, and we tell a user to uh, please enter a number like so. Uh, once he's done that, we're actually going to print the number the user entered. So let's save this and run this. It says please enter a number, and I use a I just enter a text. It says this name is not defined. But if I run the code again, it says please enter a number and I enter a numerical value. It gives me a numerical value. So what we can actually do is to kind of like force the user to enter a numerical value. So that's why we can actually do things like we can say, uh, Oops, you can say input, sorry guys, please enter a number. So what was I doing? Ah, good, so this is it. So if I enter 34, I'm going to see 34. But if I run this script and the user enters like ER or something, so he's actually getting ER, but ER is not 
a number. It's actually seeing ER as a uh, everything that we typed in right here. It's seeing it as a text. So let's go ahead and, and do this. Let's say print type number because this is very important, right? Very, very important because the input coming from your keyboard is coming in as a string. So even if I type 12, it's actually coming from my input as a string. So if I try to do something like multiply, you know, number uh, multiplied by three, if I try to multiply this number by three and store that in a value called variable called results, it's going to be equal to number multiplied by three. And I try to print results like so. If I save this and run it, and I say 78, so it's actually a string, but if I print <laughs> number multiplied by three, it's going to give me 78, 78, 78, which is not what I want. I want the result to be a numerical value. So to do that, I'm just going to say int like so to convert everything that comes in as an integer. So, so I'm just going to say convert the input to integer like so. So if I go to run and run my module and enter a number and I say 45, I can get 135 because this is like seeing it like a number. We can also do a float to convert the input to a float such that when you multiply, let's say uh, 23, we're going to get 69.0 to tell us that this is actually a float and that's the decimal value we're getting right there. So that's one cool way to uh, work with this. Now we can do a lot of things with our print statement. We can print and format output, but that's actually going to be, uh, you know, we don't want this scope to be uh, super duper, um, super long. So guys, uh, I think I'm gonna just stop right here because uh, I don't want this to be an extremely long video. Already it's like an hour long. So I just wanted to show you how you can, you know, can start Python and how you can play with the interpreter and you know what kind of data types you can create. And we also looked at what functions we had available, how we can get the length of elements, how we can like slice strings, and also how we can work with some basic functions. And finally, we've learned how to get the input from a user. Now, these are all introductory basic Python stuff just to get your feet wet. There's still a whole lot more to cover in a uh, much more, you know, focused and uh, I'll be creating much more content in a much more focused approach rather than just uh, slam everything like in this video. So this is actually going to be uh, one of my longest videos ever. <laughs> I actually like to make very short, impactful five to 10 minutes videos. But this one, remember, is just to show you uh, what we can actually do with Python. So you actually went from uh, creating a comment. We talk about variables and data types. And next we actually played around with very basic few uh, string methods and applied some slicing to those string methods. And we also looked at the uh, user input. So uh, once again, thank you very much for watching guys. I'm gonna be uh, uploading these uh, codes to GitHub. In fact, let me just go ahead and upload these to GitHub and I'll show you a link. I'll share the link where you can download the code so you can follow along with the video. If you want, you can play around with this and change things and ask me any questions. So once again, thank you very much guys for watching. Now on GitHub, if I give you the link and you jump to the GitHub link, let's see, uh, let me just quickly open up my uh, GitHub account and I'll show you where and how you can kind of like download this. So let's say for instance, it's uh, super here. You, if I give you the link, you just go to this here code and you just download the zip file. So once you've downloaded that zip file, you can go ahead and open up the uh, zip file like so. So I'm just open this and just say extract all and click extract. 
and this should open up a file and you can actually see the contents in that uh, file this is actually for a node.js program I'm working on but that's how you can actually have access to uh, the content once I give you the link so you can have access to these script files again if you have any contents or uh, questions sorry go ahead and ask me those questions and I'm pretty much sure to answer so thank you very much for joining me in your first day using Python